a limited podcast series brought to you by IG in partnership with your host, The Finance Ghost. Over the course of our upcoming episodes, we are delving deep into the world of trading, helping both novice and seasoned traders alike navigate this exciting field. Join us as we unravel the intricate strategies and insights that define this dynamic landscape and the beautiful puzzle that is the markets. IG Markets South Africa is an authorized financial services and over-the-counter derivatives product provider. CFD losses can exceed your deposits. Welcome to the second episode in this series called The Trader's Handbook and you've hopefully now listened to episode one which set the scene of what it is that we are up to here and certainly what we are hoping to achieve. And of course the point overall is to bring you great insights into the world of trading. And of course we certainly hope that your IG demo account is set up by now. If you haven't done that you totally should. It's quite an easy process and there really is nothing quite like seeing it on your screen. All those wonderful tickers and red and green and all the data points and the charts and all the cool things you can do with it. There's nothing quite like having that on your screen. So if you haven't set up your IG demo account, then uh, please go and do that so that you can have a bit more context to what it is we are talking about. I set mine up about a week or so ago, Sean, and I've even put on my first trade, but we can of course get to that later. First, let me just remind the listeners that although I am hosting this podcast for IG as the finance ghost, the insights really are coming from Sean Murison, who is a senior market analyst for IG. And Sean, I really look forward to the second show. And I think we may as well start right at the beginning. We touched on this a little bit in episode one, but I'm going to hit you as part of saying hello to you with the most basic first principles question of them all. What is trading? Hello. Uh, short-term trading, very, very simply, is looking at trying to generate a short-term profit in financial markets across different asset classes. So it could be forex, commodities, indices, shares, you know, local shares, international shares. And generally, you use instruments like CFDs, leverage instruments, which sounds complicated, but it's, not, uh, it's still looking at the same products that you'd be used to trading um, for normal investing, uh, which carry a degree of leverage. And so what that means is it just magnifies your profits or losses within the market. So it allows you to get in and out quicker. And of course, here, when we say instruments, we don't mean a Yamaha piano. Uh, <laughs> we mean a type of financial, well, I, don't, I actually don't know what, how to describe it really. It's effectively a financial contract, a financial asset. I mean, that's what, that's what the C in CFD stands for, is contract for difference. So when we talk about financial instrument, we're basically just talking about this thing you buy in order to express a view on a particular underlying asset in this case. It's a strange term for those who aren't necessarily familiar with the markets, of course. Yeah, and that obviously, yeah, CFD, as the name implies, contract for difference. It really is just a contract for the difference in price of whatever you're trading. So if you're looking at buying a share on the JSC, for example, you bought it for 10 Rand and you sold it for 11 Rand, the contract is for the difference in price. That difference would be 1 Rand and you'd make 1 Rand for every share that you had. And of course, what's interesting with that is you can make money if the share goes up, you can make money if the share goes down, depending on whether you went long or short. And we're going to get into all of that stuff as well on the show. And some of the detail of the different ways you can use these CFDs, the different instruments you can trade, the different underlying assets that you can reference when you trade, because of course, that's really important as well. But I think before we get to some of the plumbing around how you actually do this stuff, you know, recognizing that trading is really this kind of short term profit a strategy at the end of the day that's what makes it different to investing you know it's all about getting those short-term gains is it a different type of person perhaps who should consider trading to investing you know are these people who naturally just want to be more active in the market as opposed to a once a month debit order into an etf and they build up their wealth over time which of course there's absolutely nothing wrong with and i think all traders are doing that anyway as investors trading is just something a little bit different to that isn't it yeah, I think uh, trading it could form part of investment portfolio. Um, it is obviously seen as a higher risk way of accessing financial markets. So it shouldn't be the bulk of your investment portfolio. Um, but anyone who is interested in speculating in the market, uh, this is a product uh, they could consider. It doesn't just have to be used for uh, speculation, as we've talked about in the past. You know, you can use it to ensure hedge an underlying portfolio. So you've got a whole big basket of South African shares. You could take a short position on the index, the, the JSC All Shared in Index, or the Top 40 Index. And if the market does come down, you'd protect the value of those underlying assets. So it's, uh, trading is for anyone that is interested in speculative uh, addition to their portfolio, or someone is looking at hedging out some risk in an underlying equity portfolio. 
And in terms of theoretical knowledge, I think on fundamental investing, people understand that they need to be able to read financial statements. They need to work through an earnings transcript or an annual report or whatever the case may be. You need to read quite widely. You need to be on top of news flow. There's a lot of fundamental stuff that goes into a successful investment because at the end of the day, you're trying to find some kind of company or whatever it is you're buying that will give you this great long-term risk-adjusted return. So instead of going and just buying a JSE Top 40 ETF or an S&P 500 ETF, you are looking for stocks that on a risk-weighted basis will beat that, i.e. beat it considerably over a period of time, which is in and of itself a difficult thing to do. Now, trading is also a difficult thing to do, but I think the theoretical knowledge base that you need to get it right is a little bit different. I mean, that's where the sort of technical trading skill set really comes to the fore, which is learning how to read charts. Yeah, so charts, obviously, uh, a lot of people that come to financial markets uh, from a trading perspective, uh, you know, they aren't financial advisors or asset managers, and they learn to understand what's happening in markets by, by looking at technical analysis, looking at charts. Um, you know, in the short term, when you look at markets, it is a voting game. So you'll see, you know, news comes out, news drives sentiment, and markets react very short term to that, that sentiment, you know, whether it's a, you know, company releases results, or we have an inflation reading out of the US or local, that'll drive some sentiment in markets, and you'll see a move. And uh, when we're looking at technical trading, what we're doing is we're trying to just sort of catch that momentum, because we are just trying to catch a small move within that market. So, you know, if it's positive sentiment, the market might go up, and you're trying to catch a piece of that move higher, something negative that comes out, you might see the market fall a little bit, you try to catch that move lower. It's, um, it's uh, yeah, like I say, short term, it's a voting game, and you're trying to just be on the right side of the vote. Yeah, I remember that point that you raised in the first episode in the series was this concept of a voting game. And, you know, that's a really good way to put it. I mean, we're in a serious election year at the moment for a lot of democracies around the world. And of course, votes lead to volatility and surprises and people not necessarily voting in the way you expect. And I guess the markets are exactly the same. It's about understanding that sentiment and how it swings and where it swings and knowing when to get out of the way of that, knowing when not to fight the market and knowing when to say, hang on, maybe the market hasn't noticed this. Maybe I've spotted something really interesting here. You know, let me take a view on it. Yeah, I think just adding to that, it's also just being aware of it. So, you know, when we're trading is that, you know, we'll do our analysis and we'll have ideas around the market, but know when those high impact data points are coming out. You know, inflation has been a key theme in global markets um, for, for quite a long time right now because that drives interest rates and monetary policy, which obviously affects um, equity markets, bond markets. And so just being aware of, you know, when that data is coming out. Um, I think that's a good starting point for traders is that just have a, an economic calendar out there so lots of places where you can access that. IG has an economic calendar on its website. And a lot of those, those data points say, well, this is what's expected of the news. And, and this is what was previous. And you know, generally, if it's better than expected, it's positive for short-term market sentiment. And if that news comes out and it's worse than expected, well, it's negative for market sentiment and we expect the prices to go down. So the first point in call there, I think, is just be aware of news and data that is coming out um, and trading accordingly. And if that is a high-risk data point and you don't want to be involved in that market, if you don't want to take that extra risk, then you know you can always just sit on your hands and wait for the next opportunity. So this actually brings us to a really interesting concept around trading, and maybe it speaks to the type of people who should look to get involved here and what sort of commitment you're really making. And obviously it depends. You know, There's traders who do this for a living. Uh, there are many traders who do it for a living. That's obviously the hardest way to do this because you literally eat what you kill, and uh, you can very quickly hurt yourself in the markets if things go wrong. That's maximum pressure trading. Obviously, there are ways to do it, you know, on a much, much smaller scale, which I think is how most people would do it, is to say, this is part of my portfolio. You know, I still have a day job. I'm not sitting there trying to sculpt little amounts off the market all day long, because uh, your boss probably won't approve of that too much. So, you know, this is about just understanding what are some of the things you're willing to get involved in? What are you not willing to get involved in and why? And I guess regardless of whether you are doing this full time or you are doing this part time, you still need to have a plan, whether that's for your trading day or your trading week or, you know, whatever the case may be. So how do you kind of build that out? I mean, you've really referenced there some of the economic releases and just having a proper idea of that calendar. You know, are these tools available within 
the IG ecosystem. And I'm, I'm sure the recommendation would be that people just also read widely to make sure they're getting, you know, all kinds of different inputs here. Yeah, there's lots, uh, we do have lots of tools available um, to subscribers. Uh, a lot of that data is free. So uh, we have daily and weekly uh, newsletters, you know, on Friday, we do something called a week ahead. It's, it's posted on the website, so anyone can just access that. Just painting narratives around different types of markets, you know, what's happening in the commodity space, what's happening in, you know, the index space, what's happening with local shares. And then also just helping plot out those, those calendars. So, you know, on the daily uh, updates, what we'll plot there is, you know, what companies are releasing results within the morning. So, you know, companies to watch out for, you know, any broker recommendation changes that we've picked up, you know, you know, the, you know upgrades and downgrades to, uh, to local equities. So there's a whole, a lot of free information out there. So it's really accessing it. And then it's just putting it into the right place, you know. Uh, that type of content is aimed for the trader, you know, where you, you know, just trying to get context, you know, those, understanding the narratives of what's happening in markets that we can hit. IG actually provides a live Reuters feed uh, directly into the platform so you can access live data from a broadcasting leader. Okay, fantastic. So I think let's move into what really distinguishes CFDs from your typical equity investments. And I'm just using equity as the example there. And it's it's a concept that people hear about but they don't really understand and it scares them and in some respects it should scare them because if you don't use it properly it can hurt you but if you do use it properly it's very powerful and that is this concept of leverage so i think a worked not necessarily a worked example but just the basics you know how much leverage sits inside a cfd on the ig platform you know if i have a thousand rand to invest and i just go and buy shares i'm handing over a thousand rand and i'm getting a thousand rands worth of shares okay less fees and that's basic share investment. What would that thousand rand look like in a CFD context um, with that leverage? Okay, so it really depends on the product that you're looking at. I think a lot of your listeners might be more familiar with the you know, equities and shares, but let's use an example. If you, so leverage is how much more you get uh, from that thousand rand. So essentially, if you were to buy a share, a thousand, put down that thousand rand as a deposit, uh, you might get uh, 10,000 rands worth of that share uh, to trade with. So essentially 10 times more. I'm just using that as an example. It does vary from a share to share. Sometimes you might get five times more than what you put down. Sometimes you might get you know a little bit more. It just depends on the risk profile of the share that you are trading. So essentially what that allows you to do is magnifies your profit or loss. And the extent of magnification is riskier, right? Because small moves in the underlying asset then have a bigger impact on your money that's sitting there invested. Yes. Yeah, so if you, you know, a 1% move on that share price, on let's say that that share would be equivalent to a 10% move on your CFD position. And so if it's in your favor, you'd be making 10% as opposed to the 1% on the underlying share. If it was against you, you'd be losing 10% rather than losing the 1%. And then how does it work in terms of posting margin? Because that's another term that typically gets used in these types of trades. When people talk about margin, you know, if you read financial statements, you understand margin to be the money you make off, uh, off a particular revenue number. It's a bit different in this world. So what does margin mean in the context of CFDs? Margin is basically just another word for deposit. And so, you know, an example, let's say you wanted to buy 100,000 rands worth of shares. Uh, you wouldn't have to outlay that full 100,000 rand for your position. You just need to put down a deposit for that position. Uh, which we refer to as margin. So if that deposit uh, was 10,000 Rand to get um, movement from 100,000 Rand's worth of shares, that would also be referred to as your margin. So margin deposit, same thing. And the way the margin is calculated varies, I think, per you know underlying asset class or whatever the case may be, right? Even with shares. If the shares less liquid, uh, you know, more volatile, then we might ask you to put a larger deposit down for, for that. If the shares are a lot more liquid, less volatile, then you, you'd be uh, a smaller margin requirement or deposit requirement. So margin, super interesting. Leverage and the way that works is uh, certainly something that can really magnify your returns, as you said, but something that you then need to be careful of and manage accordingly. That's why I think getting something like a demo account is just such a clever way to do it so that you can actually go and put on trades and watch your margin go into the trade, you know, like I did with mine recently, and then watch the profit and loss and see what actually happens. It's such an important part of it, right, is to do that demo trade. Yes, and I think just on that, you open accounts and you, let's say you put in, you know, 50,000 Rand, 
I would say never take that full 50,000 Rand and put it as a deposit for one trade because if it moves against you, then you're going to be in trouble. You need, you know, take a portion of that. You know, if you, you got 50,000 Rand in your account and you have to take one position, you could use 5,000 Rand as a deposit and you'd have 50,000 Rand worth of equity in the market as a CFD position. Um, as an example, so you actually don't have to leverage up your whole account, but never take all the money in your account and put it into one trade as a deposit. Um, if you want to, <laughs> if unless you you know you really want to gamble it. Yes, or commonly known as blowing up your portfolio <laughs> if it goes wrong. Yeah, and then, you know, money management, <laughs> money management becomes a key aspect. You know, to determine your success and failure in this game. Now, you know when you are trading. Um, We've, we've talked about it being a high risk environment, but you can control that risk. And there's lots of tools available to you to help control that risk. You know, we have things like stop losses. So you can actually predetermine the risk that you're taking in the trade. So you say, well, look, I only want to lose, you know, a thousand Rand. You can have your, your stop loss um, X points away from the price that you buy at or that you sell at. So from your entry point. And so even if you're not in front of your computer and your computer's closed, if it, you can predetermine your loss in the event that things move unfavorably against you. Obviously, that's not what we aim for, um, but in a high-risk environment, you can protect that. So obviously, that's not the desired result, but you just hope for the best, prepare for the worst. But you can predetermine your losses to an extent, uh, and you can control your risk. So a lot of money management does come into play with short-term trading. It is one of the uh, more important determinants of your success or failure in trading. And with that, you know, also comes the discipline of being able to execute. You know, we're not always going to get it right. Um, so it's just being prepared, you know, hope for the best, prepare for the worst. It's interesting because, of course, in investing, there's a whole school of thought that says a highly concentrated portfolio is the way you beat the market. You know, you go and you pick your five or six winners and you really put a lot of money behind them. And of course, it's great if you're right. You know, hindsight is incredibly helpful here. Uh, concentration, I'm personally not someone who does that. I prefer to have quite a few smaller positions because I know how much randomness there is in the market and also just negative surprise. You know, sometimes a company will truly shock you. News will break and a share price will take a 20% bath. And if that was a big proportion of your portfolio, you're now in serious trouble. So I guess in trading, the concentration risk issue is even worse than it is in investing because if something goes against you in a trading portfolio with leverage, it can literally wipe you out. Whereas in investing, you know, you can't lose more than you've put in when you're investing in a company. So I guess the question there is, Sean, is one is, would you agree that in terms of concentration risk, I think trading is more severe than investing? And then maybe the second point, which is something I've touched on there, this concept of losing more than you've put in. Like, how does that actually work? So if I've posted margin of 10,000 Rand on a position and the thing moves against me in a way that basically my 10,000 Rand is gone, is that trade then closed on my behalf or is it possible to lose more than that before something actually happens with that trade so if you if you're in a position right you need to ensure that in your account that you have at all times enough to cover the deposit for your trade that margin we we're talking about and any loss that you may be incurring so if you do not have that sufficient capital to cover your deposit and the loss then uh, you can be closed out of your position but like I was saying earlier on, so, you know, there's ways of managing that, that risk and automating that risk. So in theory, yes, you can. And often there's market dislocations where, and like you're saying, you know, they are compounded. They are correct. They are compounded when you're using leverage in this type of environment. But there are ways of mitigating that risk um, with things like stop loss. Now, um, IG actually has something called a guaranteed stop loss in that. So you pay a premium for that function. But, you know, even if the market was to gap, you know, you know, in the next day, open up way lower than where uh, your exit price was, uh, we'd still honor that price and get you out at that particular price. So um, there are ways of mitigating risk. It's just using the tools at your disposal. I just want to add that, you know, like we, we talk about stop loss, and, <laughs> but, you know, that stop loss can also be used to help, you know, lock in a profit. So we've talked about the downside, you know, and the risk side of things, but also let's say you're in a trade and the trade is moving favorably for you, that, you know, you're making money of it and just, well, you want to try to ride out this trend as much as possible. Um, you can actually automate that process and have that stop loss, um, you know, as the market moves in your favor, that stop loss level moving up to help actually ride out as much of that trend as possible. So now, if it does come back, you might just lock in a smaller profit than, you know, at the highs of the market, but you actually don't have to take a loss by using a tool that we call a trailing stop loss.
There really is so much to actually get to grips with in this world of trading and how the specific IG platform works. I mean, it's it's just brilliant, honestly. So conscious of the time on this podcast and how we want to try and be quite strict each week on, uh, on, on each episode on how long each one is, there's so much we can talk about. But one thing I do want to make reference to is that demo account, because I think it's important to show, you know, we're playing around with this stuff or certainly from my side, I'm getting involved in it and trying to see how it all works. So I'll talk about the the trade that I put on my first trade, because I think that'll be quite fun. And obviously, you know, these are evergreen podcasts. Ultimately, we want people to be able to listen to this for a long time at any stage in their journey with CFDs and trading and, and getting to grips with some of the concepts. So it's not like we'll go into huge detail around trade ideas, because unfortunately, as is the nature of trading, those ideas have a limited uh, shelf life. But I'll talk about the trade that I put on, which is a short position on Mr. Price. So I couldn't resist for my first trade going short, because of course, that's the biggest difference versus buying shares, is you can go short with this, whereas you can't do that when you're buying shares. So the logic I applied here was, you know, the share price ran really hard in the sort of GNU, Government of National Unity rally. Uh, the company, I think, looks a bit weak strategically compared to some of its competitors, I think you've got issues like the Chinese competitors are really strong in the value fashion game. They are disrupting Mr. Price, which doesn't necessarily have a clear strategy for me. I think Mr. Price's valuation multiple had run too hot. And then on top of all of these things, the co-founder of Mr. Price sold a bunch of shares. And director dealings are always a very, very helpful indicator of what might be going on inside a company and what the insiders think of the share price. So as you can see from all of that, it was very much a fundamental thesis for why I felt like the share price was overvalued. And I understand fully that traders would typically use technical measures to actually spot you know, which trades they want to go into. Now, obviously, technical indicators are something we'll speak about in, in episodes to come. But I guess just around that, I mean, you can play spot the investor here, right? That's such a fundamental thesis for why I put my short trade on with Mr. Price. You would probably think about it, you'd take all of that into account, but you would look at the charts, right? And and some of the key indicators. What you've done could actually fit into a, a technical strategy as well. I mean, that's a contrarian type of indication. You've, you've gone against the trend. Um, a lot of what we do, though, um, is sort of identifying the general market direction, you know, just by looking at a price on a chart of the price moving from the bottom left hand side to the top right hand side of your page, you know, the trend is up. So uh, for me, I. You are right at this point in time. So, uh, well done. <laughs> You're making some money on that trade. I've made some. I've made some lunch money. I've literally made some lunch money because even in my demo account, I did a small position. <laughs> yeah, that's fun. But um, yeah, just a different way of looking at it is 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 that the trend is up. So that general momentum, you know, joining that trend, it's easier to make money following a trend than to trade against the trend. So I think if you're doing what you're doing there, you need to be quite nimble. The sentiment is quite positive, and that's what the charts are showing us right now. But what you picked up is what I can pick up on a technical basis as well, that yes, Mr. Price ran a little bit too far. I was looking a little bit overbought. Maybe a short-term correction from that move up uh, was on the cards and it has started to manifest. My preferred approach for something like that though is if I was getting involved in something like that share, you know, at the time of this podcast, be waiting for that rather than trying to pick the top, is waiting for that weakness to play out and then looking to join that trend. So I'd be looking at getting on the long side but waiting for a bit of short-term weakness uh, to, to get involved. And that right there is the beauty of a market. I love it. Longs, shorts, different points, same stock, same underlying situation, but at different points on the chart, different strategies make sense. And I think, Sean, that's a great place to leave uh, the second episode of this podcast. Thank you, as always, for doing this with me and to the IG team and just the belief in helping investors make that leap and actually open up that demo account, do their first trade, so to our listeners, go and check out the other episodes in this series, go onto the IG website, find all of the resources there to help you learn about this. But most importantly, get that demo account set up. There's just no better way to learn than by doing and rather do it with monopoly money and learn some good lessons and some hard lessons before you do it with your real money. Sean, thank you very much. And I look forward to our next one. In our gorgeously diverse country, there really is a new reason to trade every day. Current affairs to political news can make the markets move and cause volatility, which can be advantageous to a trader. Diversify your portfolio by opening a trading account with IG and explore the possibilities of CFD trading or practice your trading skills on an IG demo account.